Hello everyone and welcome to the latest Asian Carp Canada webinar. My name is Rebecca Schroeder and I work on the Asian Carp program at the Invasive Species Center and I will be your moderator today. Before we get started with the actual presentation, there were a couple of items I wanted to mention. Um, first, there will be time for questions following the webinar. So if at any time you think of a question, please type it into the question box and I will read it out loud to our speakers so that they can answer. If you're having any issues during the webinar, you can write them in the chat box and I'll try and resolve it for you. And lastly, there will be a brief survey at the end of the webinar. So if you could take a few minutes to fill it out, that would be greatly appreciated. Today's webinar will give an overview of Canadian research on Asian carp prevention, and I am pleased to introduce our speakers, Paul Bazonic and Tej Here. Paul is a PhD student in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Toronto. He is supervised by Nicholas Mandrak and studies the movement behavior of invasive fishes and how fish movement may be altered by non-structural deterrence. Paul completed a Master of Science at the University of Toronto and a Bachelor of Science at the University of Guelph. His work is funded by Fisheries and Oceans Canada's Asian Carp Program. Tage is a PhD candidate in the Department of Physical and Environmental Sciences at the University of Toronto Scarborough. He is supervised by Nicholas Mandrak and Matthew Wells and studies spawning success of Asian carps primarily using hydrodynamic modeling. He completed a Master of Science at the University of College London and a Bachelor of Science at McGill University. His work is funded by the Fishery and Oceans Canada's Asian Carp Program and the Answer Create Great Lakes Program. So thank you to Paul and Tej for um, agreeing to be our speakers today and with that I will pass it over to them. Thank you for having us and thank you for everyone to coming out and listen. Um, so as we mentioned, today is going to be talking about a brief overview of the Canadian research going on in Canada. And the main purpose of this is to highlight three main things. First, the variety of research questions being investigated by different researchers, including the different methods and techniques used all across Canada. And these will include lab experiments, field experiments, telemetry modeling, and risk assessment. And finally, an important thing to remember is the different type of collaborations occurring between researchers across institutions and across organizations, including federal level, uh, government, provincial, and even conservation agencies. Briefly, we're going to do a quick introduction so everyone is caught up on Asian carp and why they are a threat. And we're going to split the research into two main categories. The first category is quantifying the threat, and this will look into the likelihood and impact of establishment and the likelihood of successful spawning occurring. And the second part of the talk will be focusing on the development of new technologies, specifically non-structural deterrence. Okay, so there are four uh, main species that together represent the Asian carp threat to the Great Lakes ecosystem. These are the big head, black, grass, and silver carp and each affects a different area of the food web. So here below, if you can imagine a simplified food web of the ecosystem within the Great Lakes, you have phytoplankton, which gets consumed by zooplankton and bivalve mollusks, which in turn gets affected by juvenile fish and predatory fishes. These invasive Asian cults um, consume, consume prey at different levels of the ecosystem, which can lead to trophic cascades and large-scale community changes throughout the ecosystem. Bighead carps consume zooplankton, while black carps consume bivalve mollusks, grass carps consume aquatic vegetation, and silver carps consume phytoplankton. These changes can affect both the biotic and abiotic conditions, which then leads to large-scale changes across the trophic levels from the individuals being consumed all the way up to juvenile and predatory fishes, which rely upon uh, the lower-level trophic um, communities. The Asian carp species pose a serious threat to Canada and our native fishes and our uh, commercial fishing industries. For example, Asian carp can increase operational costs of commercial fishing as well as increasing competition for food resources. Increased operational costs reduces the profit of commercial fishing and the biological changes can reduce, reduce uh, catch and this can affect uh, the landings of native fish species and in turn is going to influence harvester revenue, uh, fish processing, exports, um, and a plethora of other uh, factors. Asian carp will also impact the recreational fishing, again by increasing competition for food resources, and then this will have a concurrent effect on plankton, 
zooplankton and prey species abundance, which would then again affect food availability, native species, leading to a cascade of other effects. So they can, silver kelps also jump out of the water, which can reduce uh, the enjoyment of recreational boating, cause damage to boats and people, injure users, and increase the operational costs. The ecological changes can also produce uh, algal mats in the Great Lakes, which would affect uh, the biotic composition, as well as the shoreline um, beachfront use and the community composition. Here we see the distribution, the current distribution of the big head, silver, grass, and black kelps. You can see these species were predominantly spread throughout the Mississippi River Basin, where they have continued to move upward as well as throughout other reaches of the river basin. Um, currently, the big head and silver kelps are being controlled a, at the, near the Chicago area shipping canal, uh, which is a potential connection between the Mississippi River Basin and Lake Michigan where some grass kelps have been found uh, within the Great Lakes. However, there have been no found spawning events within Canadian waters. And here you can see uh, an image of the spread of the Asian kelps throughout the Mississippi uh, from the 1970s when they were initially introduced for aquaculture purposes, uh, but, were escaped, but had escaped through flooding events. So there is a connection between the uh, Mississippi River Basin and the Great Lakes through the uh, Chicago area waterway system and the Chicago Sanitary Ship Canal. This was a canal that was dredged in 1900 to redirect sewage and allow for flooding. It connected uh, Lake Michigan to the Day Plains River. Um, there was currently a electric barrier uh, developed here to prevent the disposal of invasive fishes, um, but this is an area of concern for uh, big head and silver kelp introduction into the Great Lakes. Because of these concerns, uh, the Canadian government uh, invested over $220 million to prevent the uh, Asian kelp threat and help manage and maintain it. They implemented a four pillar strategy to aid in the maintenance of this concern. The first was prevention. In prevention, uh, through the federal government, uh, outreach, research, and risk assessment activities have been implemented, and here we're going to talk about some of the research that's been going on uh, to help aid in the Asian kelp threat. There was also an early warning pillar. Here, through significant surveillance, uh, the federal government uh, looks at various regions. You can see in the map above uh, regular target regions, and they use uh, surveying, electric um, e-fishing, netting, and other techniques to look out for Asian kelps and have a rapid response if individuals are found. The third pillar uh, is response. Here they make advice and analysis, as well as implement the rapid, a rapid action response plan. And then finally, through management, uh, developing new regulations and pathway management. Of course, uh, the Canadian government also works closely with the American government, who have also invested significantly in managing and preventing the Asian cub threat. Um, and if you're interested in some of the research that's been going on uh, throughout the United States, you can take a look at the USGS uh, website. They already have got details about the Asian kelp integrated control and containment methods that they have going on. The first research question we will be looking into is what will the impact be of Asian carps in the Canadian Great Lakes Basin? And obviously there's a lot of research that's been going on in the, on the U.S. side because that's where the carps actually are, but it's harder to predict what those impacts will be in Canada. And so I picked two representative papers, the first being Vanderlee et al. And it's a collaboration between Fisheries and Oceans Canada and the Ontario provincial government. And what they tried to do was use bioenergenetics modeling to uh, estimate the consumption and population impacts in Great Lakes Westland. Um, and specifically, they were trying to see what the impact would be on vegetation consumption in representative areas of Lake Erie and Ontario. This graph on the left here shows three different vegetation types noted by their energy density. The top panel is the lowest energy density and the bottom panel is the highest energy density. 
the green color indicates that the vegetation would be remaining and the red color indicates that vegetation wouldn't be remaining. And as we see here, if we move along the x-axis, so grass car biomass is increasing, especially for the lower energy density, there will be less proportion of the vegetation remaining. And at the higher one, there will still be situations in which there are some vegetation remaining. And overall, the conclusion by these authors was that most simulated scenarios resulted in less than 50% of vegetation remaining in an invaded land, wetland after only one year. And the majority of this consumption came from pre-adult stages. So that's a demonstrable impact that the grass carp could have on an invaded wetland. The second representative study that I used was uh, more of a socioeconomic one, and it was prepared by Hayter, and it tried to model the economic impact of Asian carps on the commercial and recreational fishing industry. And the first step of that was to actually quantify what the value of these industries were. And as you can see from this table here, um, it's in the millions up to the billions. Commercial fishing has approximately 227 million, and I should clarify this is just in the Canadian side of the Great Lakes Basin, and these are in Canadian dollars. Um, but recreational boating is all the way up to 7.3 billion, and in total, it's $8.5 billion just for these activities. So then they projected how much risk uh, each Great Lake would be at for uh, detrimental effects of Asian carbs. And what they found is shown on this graph uh, on the left here. And they just classified the four different four of the five lakes into low, moderate, or high risk, and they did this after 20 years. And obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty in these types of projections, but they found that the low risk would like lake would be Lake Superior, and three of the other lakes would have moderate risk. However, in 50 years, they found that the risk would be much higher for Erie, Huron, and Ontario, and that it would only be moderate for Superior. So now we have impacts not only on the vegetation, but also on the socioeconomic side. The next question that we're looking into is how likely is an establishment? We know that it's gonna be bad if they show up, but how likely is that to occur? And a fundamental paper for this uh, question was Cuttington et al. And they tried to find if you could use population modeling to examine the probability of a population establishing in one of the Great Lakes from just a small number of fish. And what they found was shown on the left here. And uh, the x-axis of this graph is the age at first reproduction. So you can see that the earlier that uh, a carp reproduces, uh, younger I should say, uh, the population growth rate would be much higher. And then when each of these categories, they had three different model runs showing the amount of eggs released per female. And obviously as the amount of eggs went up, the population growth rate went up. So if the carp mature at a younger age and then release more eggs, uh, the population growth will be significantly higher than if they mature at a later age and release less eggs. And their final conclusion was that establishment is quite likely for a large number of scenarios. So that's a greater than 75% probability that they would only require less than 20 fish. So that's 10 fish of each sex to form an establishment. So that's obviously not very good news. The next question is, is there suitable habitat for these carp uh, when they come to Canada? And again, this was a paper done by Herberg et al. And they did it for a variety of uh, invasive species, but they included Asian carp. And what they found was, what well, using ecological niche modeling to find suitable habitats, they found four different maps that I'm gonna show you, one for each of the carp. The first is for grass carp. And as you can see, a lot of Southern Canada is suitable for the grass carp um, in a lot of scenarios. So it's, there is a lot of suitable habitat for the grass carp and you can see similar trends in the silver carp as well as the big head carp and slightly better news as we come to the black carp. Um, and the authors noted that the highest risk of introduction and establishment is in the area around Toronto. So we know that there's gonna be a demonstrable negative impact. We know that in a small amount of individuals can lead to establishment. And we know that there's pseudo habitat throughout Canada. But now the next question is, is how would carp spread through the Great Lakes? And primarily through northward migration through the Great Lakes. As some of you know, the carp are currently spawning in the sand, the grass carp specifically, are currently spawning in the Sandusky River, which is in the Lake Erie Basin. And there's a modeling paper by Curie et al., which was a collaboration through the federal government and the University of Toronto Scarborough, 
where they tried to model the spread of grass carp throughout the Great Lakes Basin. And the results showed that they were able to spread into all the Great Lakes if it arrives in establishment, although it will take much longer to get to Lake Superior. And a figure from that uh, paper is shown here on the left. And the introduction is occurring where that tiny red dot is, which is near the Chicago area. And as you can see, over five years, 10 years, all the way up to 50 years, that the carp begin to spread to the other lakes. And another scenario that they ran was if it was introduced in the Maumee River. And you see much less spread in this scenario, but there is still spreading at least to two lakes. But this shows that different points of introductions can have different spread. Um, but if you had multiple introductions, it's obviously not looking good uh, for spread across the Great Lakes, specifically for grass carp. A second paper is, was done by Kim and Madrak, and this was looking at the Welland Canal, which separates Lake Erie from Lake Ontario, and has a series of locks that uh, they were trying to see if fish could move through. And they used the telemetry system to place fish at different points inside the canal and to see if they could make it to the lakes. Um, they released 179 fish of 10 species, and this was a multifold year study. And what they found was seven of the tagged fish, if they released them inside the canal, could move into the lakes, Ontario or area. So to be clear, this does not show any movement from the Lake Erie side to the Lake Ontario side or vice versa, but from the canals into the lakes, which is still troubling because it shows that even a low percentage of fish can move through these locks. And one final uh, vector of introduction that has been uh, studied by Andrew Drake and Nick Mandrak along with collaborators is that uh, live bait as a form of introduction, the live bait trade specifically. And the studies mostly focused on all aquatic invasive species, but they do uh, can be used in the context of Asian carp. And they uh, use both surveys of anglers and models to quantify the threat of transport. For use, so they used two different methods, and what they found was that even with regulations and anglers actively killing the invasive bait fish, there is still a low probability of live bait fish introductions of invasive grass carp. Uh, and the problem is, is that there's such a large amount of angler trips, close to four million per year, that it's, this is still a plausible method for introduction of young grass carp to the Great Lakes. There are still some ongoing questions, and the first of this is, how will climate change impact Asian carp populations? And to answer this question, uh, recently, the Nick Mandrak and the Andrew Drake, co-supervising a student in, at the University of Toronto Scarborough, his name is Eric Dean, and he's hoping to develop models that predict how populations of invasive carp species will fare under future climate scenarios. Uh, we look forward to his results. The second ongoing question we're going to delve a little deeper into here is, can Asian carp successfully spawn in tributaries to the Great Lakes? And to introduce this topic, we're going to do a bit of background required for the next few slides. And these are the three pillars of what is required to spawning, uh, for spawning, successful spawning to occur. The first is that the eggs need to be suspended at the time of hatching. And this is dependent on the flow velocity and the turbulence. Uh, the second is how long do the eggs need to be in the water? So how, what is the hatching time? And this is dependent on the water temperature. A higher water temperature will lead to a quicker hatching time and vice versa. And the final question is uh, when will the carp actually spawn? And current research indicates that they will spawn during a high flow event, specifically during a rising hydrograph. So keeping this in mind, there was uh, a study done by Mandrak et al. Um, which assess the suitability of tributaries across the Canadian Great Lakes Basin to carp spawning. And what they did was, in areas of sparse data, they used temperature data and flow gauges to try and characterize the hydrological and temperature of each of the tributaries that they had access to data. So they put together data over multiple years, and they tried to paint a picture of what carp suitability would look like. And what they found is shown here on the graph to the right. Uh, the green dots indicate that there is no suitability to carp spawning, and the red dots indicate that there is high suitability. And as you can see, there's a lot of red dots indicating that uh, a lot of these tributaries may potentially be able to harbor uh, successful carp spawning. As I mentioned, this study used uh, sparse data, so a follow-up study looked into using 
more temporally dense data. And this was done in collaboration with the Toronto and Region Conservation Agency, and it used temperature loggers and gauging stations from 2009 to 2014 on eight tributaries to the Toronto area. And the use of this temporally dense data allows not only for interannual variation to be compared, also it allowed for more variation within a year because it was using daily data as opposed to biweekly data that the, previously, that the previous studies used. And the results using just the mean data over the 2009 to 2014 period showed that only two of the tributaries were suitable. However, when you looked at just one year individually, you could see a variation in the amount of tributaries suitable. Specifically, in 2012, there were five tributaries suitable. So the results of this assessment show that if you have access to data that allows you to do it on a year-to-year -year basis, the results may vary when compared to using biweekly or mean data. Um, but together, both of these assessments show that there are tributaries in the Toronto area and across the Canadian Great Lakes Basin that are suitable for carp spawning. Um, and both of these assessments can be used for preventative efforts, including early detection and rapid response programs by Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And another cool thing was that the second preliminary assessment was done in coordination with the conservation agency, and the method can also be used in the future by that conservation agency. So we use general data, mean daily velocity and mean temperature in those studies. But as we know, rivers can vary in different flow scenarios. So the next step is to look at how will carp spawning change in different flow scenarios. And to do that, we use river modeling. And functionally, river modeling is just a computer model that recreates the hydrodynamics of a river. And inside that uh, river model, you can throw in eggs and be able to simulate a spawning event. This work was based off of work done at the USGS and also is uh, currently being worked on with the USGS. Um, to, an example of this model is going to be shown on the Sandusky River. And the reason we chose the Sandusky River is that it's a tributary to Lake Erie and that grass carp are currently spawning in the lower Sandusky River and there are egg captures being made in that river which can guide the modeling effort. Uh, just so everyone is oriented, this is uh, the river model of the Sandusky River and that's the flow direction. So the carp uh, eggs are going to be laid upstream and they're going to flow downstream uh, to Lake Erie. And the best way to look at this is through uh, an animation. And I'm going to run the animation for one flow scenario, starting in a high flow event in 2017, beginning at uh, July 10th at 12 o'clock, and then running for 31 hours. 31 hours is the time required to hatch based on the water temperature at the time. There is one big assumption that if the eggs exit the model domain, they will go into Muddy Creek Bay and into Lake Erie, where they are assumed not to hatch because lower velocity and turbulence will allow the eggs to sink and they become buried in the sand where they are less likely to hatch. And another assumption is eggs that are settled in the river will also not be able to hatch. So I'm going to run a dual animation here. Uh, this is the Sandusky River. Um, and the eggs you're going to see are spawning upstream, and they will begin to move downstream. So you see the front of the plume is eggs largely traveling at the uh, mean velocity. And you're going to see these eggs appear in the second animation, and you're going to see them uh, flow right out of the model domain. Again, that is eggs that are going to settle and potentially not hatch. But if you look back at where the eggs were close to spawning, you can see that eggs are continually being resuspended. And what's happening here is that there were low velocity zones which the eggs were caught in, and then as the discharge graph goes up, those eggs become resuspended. And now you can see at 31 hours that there are still eggs within the model domain that are suspended, and this is uh, approximately 13% of the eggs. So the hatching rate in this one flow scenario would be 13%. And we see in other flow scenarios similar hatching rates, so we show that even in high flow scenarios, eggs can hatch. And this is a cool tool that can be used to inform, pre inform prevention efforts, because you can run at different flows and see different hatching successes. And obviously, this is very river specific, so we are building models on other rivers. Specifically, I'm building a model on the Don River and hopefully the Rouge River, where we can use these model results to hopefully inform prevention efforts. Uh, one research question of, regarding spawning is would they spawn? We know that spawning could lead to hatching success, um, but do we know that the fish will be able to find a mate? And Cuttington et al. did a modeling study. The, 
to see the probability that a successful mating would occur. So their question was, would a female find a mate in a small population of carp? And the results were, even if there were a small amount of fish um, at a small amount of rivers, there would be larger probability of successful mating occurring. If there were more rivers uh, with a small amount of carp, there would be less chance that they could find a mate. However, the probability goes up as the population size increases. So this is an intuitive result. More carp, more chance that a spawning will occur. And one useful tool is a risk assessment. And there's been a couple risk assessments done uh, from 2004 onwards. And what these risk assessments do is that they synthesize all the current research and they provide scientifically defensible advice on prevention, monitoring, early detection, and management. And this is very useful because there's all these different research questions happening. And this one document brings them all together and presents them in a way that has practical implications. And the most recent one was the ecological risk assessment of grass carp done by Cudmore et al. Okay, so in addition to quantifying uh, the threat of the Asian carp introduction, Canada has also been doing some work on developing new technologies uh, to help deter the disposal of these Asian carp uh, into the Great Lakes. And of course, Canada has been working as well with the United States. Uh, we've been doing considerable efforts on evaluating new technologies to aid managers in battling the invasion of the Asian carp. An example of this could have been the um, development of plans to implement a non-structural deterrent system within Brandon Road Lock and Dam. Here they were going to use multimodal deterrents, including an electric barrier, water jets, complex noise, and flushing to uh, prevent further disposal of the Asian carp. Uh, however, plans for this have been placed on hold uh, for now. So there's three different burial design, general burial designs you could use uh, to prevent the disposal of them in or throughout the Great Lakes. The first one being a physical burial, either a velocity burial or hydrological separation. A case was made uh, to separate the uh, Mississippi and Great Lakes river basins. Um, there was a paper written by both American and Canadian authors uh, in the Journal of Great Lakes Research. However, um, plans to uh, separate the hydrological connection uh, have not gone through. Uh, in 2009, there was a lawsuit filed uh, that went through the Supreme Court, uh, through the U.S. Supreme Court, to close the Chicago Sanitarium Ship Canal. Uh, however, due to the effects on um, movement of millions of tons of shipment, as well as economic costs and uh, jobs to hundreds of uh, employees, uh, this was uh, shut down. So additional burial technologies do exist. Uh, one example would be physiological burials. Here, fish physiology cannot overcome the conditions created by the burial. Uh, there has been some studies in Canada. Uh, J. Wu Kim and Nicholas Mandrak studied the effects of uh, vertical burials on the movement of common kelp uh, in 2016. An example of an electric burial would be that, the one that they deployed at the Chicago area shipping canal. Uh, this one has been deployed since 2002. It's about 40 kilometers away from Lake Michigan. Um, and this is what has been used as kind of like the last line of defense of the big headed cubs traveling uh, potentially into the Great Lakes. However, uh, there are some concerns as magnetic fields can be distorted when the steel hull bulges uh, pass through. And then another te uh, burial technology could be uh, behavioral burials. So here you alter fish behavior such that they avoid uh, the, the deterrence and they no longer enter the novel region. And examples of this could be acoustic or stroboscopic, stroboscopic stimuli. Uh, there's a lot of interest in the use of acoustic deterrence because there should be some level of species specificity. So uh, Asian cults are hearing specialists. Uh, they have some specialized hearing anatomy that allows them to hear uh, sounds at a lower frequency and at a wider range than some other hearing generalists, such as perhaps uh, the lake sturgeon or paddlefish. So I'm going to talk to you now quickly about a couple uh, studies that Canada has been um, implementing to take a look at non-structural deterrence and some of the progress that we've been making. These include two behavioral lab studies and then two field studies. Uh, Canada has been using studies on common kelp uh, as a surrogate for Asian kelp species. This is because it's actually illegal to house uh, live Asian kelps in Canada. 
This is in an effort to prevent their introduction and their disposal through. Uh, Canada wants to limit all the potential vectors for movement. So uh, using Asian kelps for the studies was, was off the books. However, common kelp are hearing specialists similar to the Asian kelps, um, and they are conservative surrogate. Um, they have been determined to display muted avoidance responses in comparison to some of the avoidance responses seen in the big head and silver kelp. And there is also a body of literature. There have been previous studies that have been looking at the use of non-structural deterrents on common kelp. So the first study uh, looked at the behavior of common kelp before, during, and after uh, stimulus activation. And they looked at, uh, we looked at both strobe light, acoustic, and combined stimuli. So here we can see them uh, responding and avoiding uh, some stimuli placed in the middle of the tank. This study showed us that uh, the stimuli do alter the common kelp behavior. However, the results that we were seeing were affected by the laboratory setting, uh, and we would need to uh, upscale into a field environment to get more realistic uh, field results that we would want to implement and relate to management. A second field study that we, a second laboratory study that we conducted uh, was the use of choice arenas and motivating individuals to enter a novel environment using carbon dioxide. So here we can see three treatments. In the first are those two chambers and common kelp are free to move back and forth as they please. In the second treatment, the chamber where the common kelp is acclimated to uh, gets inundated with carbon dioxide, which pushes the individuals into the novel chamber. And in the third treatment, uh, again, they get pushed from their acclimated chamber into the novel chamber, but in the new chamber, uh, we have placed acoustic and stroboscopic stimuli. Uh, you can kind of think of this as putting the kelps between a rock and a hard place, and they have to choose between uh, avoidance of deterrent. Findings from these studies showed that turning on the uh, behavior with deterrent significantly increased the latency to enter the novel environment. Uh, individuals were not willing to enter the environment when the acoustic and stroboscopic stimuli were de uh, deployed. Um, and some individuals uh, remained in the CO2 chamber with uh, continually degrading uh, environmental conditions until they lost equilibrium, at which point we had to end the trial. We also looked at inter-individual differences. So we repeated a number of fish multiple times to see if there was differences between individuals in the concentration of carbon dioxide that was required to motivate them towards the novel chamber. And we found that there were consistent individual differences. Uh, so this is something that we need to consider moving on into the future. Uh, some individuals uh, are more willing to interact with the avulsive stimuli than others. Moving on into a larger uh, field environment, uh, we conducted a telemetry study within a ship slip that was 110 meters long by 36 meters and 8 meters deep. Here we outfitted fishes with uh, telemetry tags that would track their position every two to three seconds and we looked at their movement in response to an acoustic stimuli that was in the middle of the ship slip and a series of stroboscopic lights that were bisecting uh, the mesocosm in two. Just waiting for a second for my slides to advance. Okay, uh, and so here we can see uh, what that stroboscopic stimuli looked like uh, when it was activated. Through the telemetry data, we can look at how their behavior was affected during and after the stimuli. In these plots here, we can see the darker lines of higher densities of fish. So this is where fish were spending more of their time, and we can see how this changed in response to whether the stimulus was active or inactive. We could also look at movement rates the amount of space that they used, whether or not individuals were clustering or separating, um, and whether or not their behavior responses lasted over some time after stimulus inactivation. Another study uh, that we're currently conducting uh, is to determine their effectiveness. And to do this, uh, we have integrated non-physical deterrents within a physical structure. So this is the fishway at the Hamilton Harbor uh, Cruise Paradise uh, connection. So fishes traveling from Hamilton Harbor, uh, which is the inlet at um, Lake Ontario, 
are trying to get into Food's Paradise wetland. And there was a physical structure here that the fishes must pass through. Using this structure, we were aimed to determine how behavioral barriers would affect native and non-native species, and whether the behavioral barriers were effective in the field. Uh, so we integrated acoustic and stroboscopic stimuli in some of the gates. Uh, this visual is a schematic of the fishway above and below water uh, when you're looking from the Lake Ontario side into the wetland side. And so fishes traveling would be blocked by the grates and would pass into these uh, openings here, which are in fact uh, cages that trap the fish until they can be manually sorted later. And we can observe changes in capture rates when these stimuli are active or in inactive to determine whether or not the acoustic and stroboscopic stimuli are being effective. So we would expect uh, generally fishes continue to pass through and are trapped, whereas when you apply the acoustic and deterrent, acoustic and stroboscopic deterrent, we would expect to reflect some of the fishes. And of course, we can also look at common kelp as well as a plethora of native species as well that are trying to interact and get into the wetland. And so we are currently analyzing those results. Um, but we are seeing a mixed result. Uh, so far, we implemented it for the first time in summer 2018, and we've got about a 40% 40, 40 uh, reduction in capture rate in the common kelp capture rates when the stimuli are activated. Uh, however, there's a lot of room for refinement um, to increase that ability as well as improve the durability of the stimuli that we are using. And we also pit tagged 300 individuals um, of these individuals, we took a subset back to look at metabolic measurements, behavioral measurements, and through these, we're going to further investigate whether or not differences between individuals affect uh, their interaction with the deterrent stimuli. And then additionally, we tagged some so we can look at their large-scale movement patterns um, and see whether or not they return in the following year. Additional technologies that have been investigated uh, by Canadian researchers also include a bubble wall, a electric barrier, as well as various forms of sound deployment and design. Um, these have been written up in uh, documents uh, through the Department of Fisheries and Oceans uh, website, and these are going to be further refined and analyzed. Carbon dioxide is another technology which has been investigated. Um, so through collaborators, uh, both American and Canadian uh, individuals have been exposed to elevated carbon dioxide concentrations. Here, carbon dioxide can be used as, at first, uh, behavioral deterrent where the individuals avoid the noxious stimuli, but then at higher concentrations, it becomes a physiological deterrent uh, where fish respiration is affected and in individuals would lose their equilibrium and no longer be able to pass through a uh, targeted region. Ongoing research as we go into the future includes continuing to collaborate with the United States and other nations to develop robust, reliable uh, deterrent strategies, as well as management strategies, uh, to continue to refine our understanding of Asian kelp threats, and to continue to evaluate deterrent effectiveness within the lab and the field. Um, in conclusion, uh, we wanted to state that this was a brief overview of Canadian research rather than an exhaustive summary. Uh, there are some studies, of course, that, uh, that were conducted that we did not include in this um, presentation here. And that the invasion of Asian kelps into the Great Lakes is a significant threat, uh, but considerable research is being conducted uh, to refine our understanding uh, and manage this threat. And with that, Sage and I would like to say thank you, um, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Paul and Tej. That was um, a really great overview of all the exciting research going on. So now I will open it up to any questions, and I see that we have a few that came through um, during your presentation. So the first question um, was from specifically slide 11, and the question is, is the federal $20 million investment an annual budget? Okay, let me see if I can get back to that slide. You might just have to click the screen, yes. Yeah. 
We're getting there. Thanks for the patience. Oh, there we go. Okay. So what was the what was the question regarding the twenty million dollar investment? Um, the question was, is that a federal? Um, sorry, is it an annual budget? So um, I believe this one has a five year component. So this was this is actually the second investment. Uh, the first one was I, I believe fifteen million for five years, and then this one again now in twenty eighteen was twenty million over a spread of another five years. So not annual. Um, but in uh, five-year segments, so that we can plan continued uh, research into the future, uh, but this budget could be expanded or um, as needed uh, after this five-year contract. And this $20 million investment includes uh, research across all four pillars, as well as the surveillance, the rapid response, the regulation development, the outreach, um, all all work that is flowing through the uh, Asian Cal Prevention Plan uh, is being is being funded by this investment. Awesome. Um, the next question is: Was predation on eggs taken into account in the model for the river modeling? Uh, predation on eggs was not taken into account because that's a bit of a knowledge gap where we don't know the uh, types of numbers of the eggs that would. Uh, be eaten. Um, that is obviously something that we're looking into in the future, and that would lower the success of the hatching rates. So it's just something to keep in mind. Great. Uh, the next question is, how efficient are the different types of barriers on limiting carp egg diffusion downstream? On limiting carp eggs, uh, most of the barriers uh, may not be specifically efficient. There, the, the behavioral deterrence uh, would, not, would not apply because the, the eggs are passively moving through. Some of the more physical or physiological designs could have a component. So I was interested in using velocity barriers so you can affect the, uh, the hydrological flow of the system. So if you could reverse the flow, depending on whether or not the eggs are moving upstream or downstream, uh, you can have effective barriers there. Um, but most of the uh, non-structural deterrents are interested in preventing the dispersal of uh, cubs into the Great Lakes or into spawning tributaries so they don't lay eggs in the first place, as opposed to managing egg movement. Um, that would be that would involve different technologies. The next question is, are the research efforts between DFO, USGS, US Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Army Corps completely shared and coordinated to avoid unnecessary duplication? Uh, there is a considerable amount of coordination uh, between all of the American and Canadian organizations and institutions. Um, there is the binational uh, collaboration as well as the Asian Cup Regional Coordinating Committee that works to try to reduce, um, uh, over, reduce overlap or inefficient work. Also, uh, there's con consistent meetings at different uh, conferences and collaborative, collaborative efforts to make sure that we're all working uh, together. I know, for example, they spent a couple months uh, at the USGS um, working with their models and refining his model uh, to improve a system for both. Uh, I've attended, uh, there's been some, uh, there's an acoustic deterrent workshop uh, where collaborators from both the Canada and the US uh, met and related their research together to see where the state of the science was um, and what should be done moving forward. And then of course, just generally through uh, various conferences uh, such as the uh, American Fishery Society or the International Association of Great Lakes Research, uh, there's regular communication between scientists uh, from both Canadian and American institutions. Great. The next question is, was the cumulative deterrent effect studied, um, so stroboscopic plus um, CO2 plus electromagnetic? Um, there has been no study in Canada that combines all of those studies. Uh, so there's been studies that look at the combination of acoustic and stroboscopic, uh, as well as future work that's going to combine acoustic, stroboscopic, and carbon dioxide. Um, but I, I, electromagnetic, and I believe there was a second one mentioned in, the, uh, in that question, have not been investigated within the combined response. Generally, uh, the theory behind making 
an integrated uh, that's closely determined with multiple components is that you get to improve redundancies, um, you get to affect various modalities of sensing. The fishes are not going to just see something, they're going to feel it, uh, sense it, hear it, smell it, and so on. And so when you can add more stimuli, you can make a more robust barrier. Um, and that's what you want when you implement, implement these barriers, and that's what you want in managing the Asian kelp threat. The next question is, were the effects of the barrier treatments on the movement of native fishes monitored or measured? So um, there were two field studies that looked at uh, common kelp in response to the stimuli. Within the, um, I don't know if it's worth uh, going back to the slide, but the first one where we used a telemetry array and we tagged fishes. In addition to tagging common kelp, we also tagged uh, some other native fishes such as big mouth buffalo, gizzard shad, pike, uh, brown bullhead. And through these studies, we found uh, that they do as well uh, affect their behavior. Um, we do see species specific effects. So, uh, for example, common kelp have a much larger response than you would see with, for say, gizzard shad. Um, but there were some levels of response uh, in the native fishes as well. So, another thing we want to be careful of uh, when we implement deterrence is how it's going to impact the native species. Ideally, we could be species specific to the level, level that we're just stopping uh, the Asian kelp. We're, uh, we're allowing our native species to move freely. However, um, there is going to be some uh, collateral effects. So if we have an extremely significant behavioral response in the Asian kelp, uh, we do expect that we're going to see some level of behavioral response in the native fishes. However, it may be a uh, less significant response than we see uh, with those target species. And as we continue to move through integrating uh, non-physical deterrence within the uh, physical burial at the Coots Paradise Fishway, uh, we, are, we are looking at the native species response. Um, so we track all the fish weight captures of all the native species. So there we see lots of, again, gizzard shad, bullhead, um, some pumpkin seed, and we see how those movement weights are affected as well. Um, the next question is, Good that you're on this slide. Um, is concerning the $20 million budget, is there any of the four pillars that require more resources than another? Uh, so I don't know if Paige and I would be the best to uh, to direct where the money should be moving throughout these four pillars. Um, as we move through different levels of different points, so right now, of course, we're only on the invasion front. We want to make sure that we stop that invasion. Uh, but there is a lot of costs that go into surveillance. So in surveillance, you need, of course, a number of electrofishing boats. You need large crews, 20 or 30 people out in the water surveying throughout uh, different regions of the Great Lakes. And so that, that's a very expensive uh, component. But of course, that's very important. And we want to make sure we know and we're hunting for the Asian kelps throughout the system. Other areas like pathway and regulation, we want to better, better understand uh, other areas that the Asian kelps could get into the Great Lakes we want to manage those and we want to shut those down as they become um, uh, known to us. So I'm going to say all four pillars are extremely important. Um, however, I don't know if I could, if I could discuss uh, specific importance of funding each one of them uh, at this time. The next question is, um, habitat suitability work identified Humber and Mimico as best suited yet you were modeling flow regimes for egg survival um, and hatch for Dawn and Rouge. Why the mismatch? So uh, for the Dawn River specifically, when I mentioned that in 2012, uh, some of the um, uh, tributaries were more suitable. Uh, so I mentioned that there were two using the mean data and then there were five using uh, inter interannual data or just one year data. Um, and in that case, the Dawn River was considered suitable, and it actually had the highest suitability seen in any of uh, the tributaries that we saw. And in addition to that, uh, there is more data available on the Dawn, and it was uh, useful to use that in the model. Um, and with regards to the Rouge, which wasn't included in the eight tributaries that I did, but it was considered suitable by the earlier Mandrak et al. 2017 study. And it obviously has a lot of wetlands near the mouth, which could be suitable habitat for um, the carp eggs to grow, or larvae. 
The next question is, can catastrophic events like flooding um, disrupt the present potential spread pathways and therefore alter the probability of invasion? Is this something that should be considered in the prevention strategy? So catastrophic flood events could, yeah, have a, a significant uh, influence on the uh, disposal uh, propagules. I know um, through the Chicago area shipping canal, uh, that, that connection between the uh, Mississippi River Basin and the Great Lakes, they do have a fence wall up that they've built, um, which currently is not, is not a concern because it's over dry land. But in a catastrophic flooding event, they now have that uh, fence up in case the water level rises that the fishes cannot dispose over what is now land when a flooding event uh, could be, you know, aquatic habitat that the fishes get over a short term uh, displayed over. So that is something to be considered. Uh, another example of it could be at the fishway, uh, where we are continually conducting uh, studies by implementing the non structured deterrents. A recent flooding event uh, raised the water level above the fishway. So there they have increased uh, the height of that physical structure to ensure that. Fishes can not only pass now, but in real flooding events. So it is something that management should be uh, aware of and, and actively work towards handling. So that looks like all the questions we have. Um, so with that, I just want to say thank you again to Paul and Tej for that great overview. Um, and thank you to everyone that tuned in. This webinar was recorded, and it will be posted on our website, um, www.asiancarp.ca, in the next couple of days. Um, and there, just another reminder that there is a very short survey following this webinar, so if you could take a couple seconds to fill it out, that would be amazing. So thank you again, everyone, for tuning in, and thank you to Paul and Tej. Okay, thank you. Bye for now.